It's after 9 o'clock, 790-2040. Happy to say that I have Coach Tom Penders joining us on the show, and we tracked him down. He's got a book out, Dead Coach Walking. He's had his physical issues over the years, but, I mean, this coaching will kill anybody out there. Tom, you with us? I'm with you. Hey, man, look, i got to ask you first, right off the bat, the rush. Give me the rush or the thrill of turning around a group of young men on a basketball court. I've done it in newsrooms, and I'll never forget the times I've done it. What is, is that the ultimate thrill in basketball other than winning it all? Well, I believe so. I mean, to me, there's no greater feeling than turning around a bunch of kids who look at themselves in a negative light and are considered by people on the outside as losers and turning them into winners. And the culture that develops, the friendships, the lifetime bonds that, that happens. I mean, I've been doing it for over 40 years in terms of high school, uh, I had championship teams in college as a head coach at 25 at Tufts University up in Boston. And cutting down nets, winning, what that breeds is a togetherness uh, and lifelong friendships between the players and the coaches. It's, I don't think you can find it in any other walk of life. You, know, you can turn around a business and get some self-satisfaction, I guess, but sometimes you have to let people go and fire people from jobs they've held for a long time and that kind of thing, which I would hate. I don't think there's any greater feeling in the world. I, You know, I, a day does not go by when I don't hear from one of my players. And now that I'm a Twitterer and Facebooker, I'm getting stuff from kids that I really haven't talked to in maybe 20 years. They've lost me or I've lost them. Their numbers have changed. They've made moves. They've gone through a divorce or something. And now we're back in touch. So, you know, and it all stems from winning. The losing teams, you know, taking over a team that was 1-20 uh, and 20 and they're seniors now and you get them to win, you know, that group of seniors might hang together. They may go back to school together. But when you have a championship, that's a reason to go back to celebrate. Your universities usually have you back to celebrate. I just celebrated a a big reunion with my coach and, and teammates from our class uh, where we really turned UConn basketball into a national power. Well, you did okay as a guard at UConn basketball, too. I'm from Providence, so I know a little bit about that. And you say about Facebook, you're right, Coach, because I have people writing to me now. Steve Lombardi wanted to say hi from back east. The Holy oh, Trinity. Yeah. I don't even know some of these people, but they all uh, they remember you from when you coached at Rhode Island, which is my school. And uh, you left in what? Two years you left a legacy on that school. Yeah, it was our two years. We took a team that was uh, won nine games and seven the year before that. I took over on October 4th. I didn't even know the players. And we won 20 games, sold out after the first three games, sold out every game we played. And uh, we went to the NIT first year. We should have been an NCAA team. We were second in the Atlantic 10. We beat West Virginia twice. They finished third, and they went over us. That was one that wasn't transparent at all, the selection process. And the next year, despite only playing six games in our own arena, uh, we took our home games to Madison Square Garden and the Providence Civic Center and uh, places like that. And then we played a, a ton of road games. And we are 11 seed probably the last team picked to go in, and we blew out Missouri and Syracuse and lost by a point to Duke. And that might have been the best team I ever coached, certainly the most fun I ever had. You know, it was a special Camelot deal. And I've my best friends in life were in Rhode Island, and my wife and I had just bought a house up there on the shore, and uh, we can't wait to get there. Sure, I used to live in Narragansett myself. Now I'm in Arizona. Now, let me, I was watching a different coach, and when, when I look at your stats, Tom, never mind won and lost, I mean, I didn't realize you were the fourth most coached games coach, too, because you're still a young guy to me, even in your 60s. But when I look back on some of the stuff you did and I compare it to the times then and now, I see coaches saying now the, the great players hold the coaches, uh, in, in a sense, they do what they want, and they hold the coaches' ransom because they're afraid they're going to transfer or they're going to do whatever. And back in the day when Bill Walton was at UCLA and all that, it wasn't like that. Has it changed that much? Well, at UCLA, they had a guy named Sam Gilbert to make sure they didn't transfer. (laughs) (laughs) 
but kids never transferred back then. Uh, and players on my Rhode Island team, none of them thought about even playing in the NBA until we had success. And uh, guys like Tommy Garrick and Silk Owens got opportunities to play. Tommy played four years in the league, and Silk played overseas. Uh, yeah, you know, now it's ridiculous, and that's all because of the AAU and the, the parental pressure. You know, when kids get these all-everything names when they're 17 years old, you know, it's killing them, it's killing the sport. You know, kids, today, you're lucky if you have one player on your roster today that winning is the most important thing. Mm. Back in 1988, the entire team, that's all they cared about. Nobody cared about stat sheets. As a matter of fact, I used to just like, grab one, roll it up in a ball, and throw it, no matter if we won or lost. You didn't know, it matter. doesn't mean anything. You play the game, and uh, you went out on the floor together as one, and that's part of, again, what you asked me earlier, you know, to... to go to Rhode Island where they were losers. They had eight straight, I think, 20 lost seasons. And to take that team to a championship level, uh, there was no greater thrill than that. Well, can, can those things happen anymore, Coach? In other words, nowadays, in 2011, are there only power schools? I mean, we see the Final Four. You got Butler. You got some schools in there that aren't really too different than a Rhode Island. Um, how about... If you got a phone call tomorrow, you're in Narragansett, you're having a beer on the water or something, and they say, hey, remember when you replaced Brendan Malone? We need that for Jim Barron right now. Come on in and, and do a couple of years at Rhode Island. Would you consider it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hope to go up there and get season tickets. And I, uh, <laughs> Already my wife and I have made some great friends with our new president and, and – uh, no, we're strictly going to be spectators, and you know, my my college coaching days are over, and that's a, a reason why I wrote the book. You know, I, I wanted to wait till I was finished, and you know, I have had basically all my life a heart condition. I almost died in '97, which is in the book, and doctors that I had were quoted and. You know, oh, it's a great they book. Me. They they sent me the PDF file of the book a couple of days ago, and I've been all over it since. I mean, you've had you were the first guy to have blood in a sock before the Red Sox legend pitcher did that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I had it so much in my shoe I could feel it squishing around, and I wore a sweater that night. The only night I think I coached in a sweater, uh, you know, in all my career because I was afraid of that happening. You know, I was fresh out of the hospital. I still had stitches in my chest, but. You know, I didn't want to miss another game. I had to miss two games the day after my surgery. So, uh, yeah, it was a weird time. And, and my doctors are, you know, the head of the Texas Heart Institute, uh, you know, is, is quoted throughout the first chapter of the book to talk about how serious it was. And I never really let on because, you know, people think you can't do things. And then I talked about it. A little bit more and more, I did something for the Discovery Channel on it so people who have heart conditions can realize that they they can have a, an active life. Yeah, you worked out throughout all of that, right, Tom? I mean, you because you were a player, obviously, and a great player. Yeah. And you worked out even right after they put this stuff in. You were always on a treadmill. You were always doing that. So you were a health-conscious guy. Yeah, well, as an athlete, you know, I looked back and I said, you know, I always... I was in super condition when I was an athlete. I played two sports at UConn. I was captain of the basketball and baseball teams, and and I was a ninth round draft pick for Cleveland. And I used to work out, you know, religiously. And then when I got to Texas, there were so many other things I had to do. And I was always a guy that said, "Well, I'll do it." I couldn't say no to anybody. And you know, I was doing 150 to 200 speaking engagements a year. Yeah. And you know, I lost that that athletic edge, and then when I had the heart scare, you know, I slowly, gradually, once I got used to the medication, got back into that routine, and, you know, I feel better than I did when I was 40, but I don't want to push the envelope. No, but you lived through it so far, Coach. The book is Dead Coach Walking. You get into some great stories about the referees, which I thought was positive. You were trying to say, this is how it should be. If you're a rookie referee, don't be calling technicals on people. Uh, there's, there's a respect there that you seem to have for these officials. Yeah, absolutely. They are critical to the game, and, and I'm excited for the sport uh, in this regard. And they, they have uh, a 
the super uh, national supervisor now, not a play on boards there, but John Adams. Is a transparency guy. He appears on CBS. He doesn't make excuses for officials. He'll tell you when somebody blew a call, or before everything was a secret. Mm -hmm. The problem is he doesn't have enough power yet. The individual conference supervisors have all the power until the tournament starts. And now he does the work, and guys advance. He's, he's given like 100 officials from the different conferences each conference gets so many, depending on how many teams they have. And then he is a guy that's a, last weekend was a flawless weekend in officiating. And coaches, I mean, coaches want to jump up and down, really. And there, there were no noticeable referees out there. You know, you everybody, mm. every, a perfect game is four or five missed calls. Yeah, and so. it's, just, it's just the reality. And, and you know, I, I have tremendous respect for what they do. Coach, I only I mean, got a few seconds. They need to give seconds, them but... more money. They need to even someday, with all the money coming in, is, is make it possible for guys to make it a full-time job and give them benefits and things like that so they don't kill themselves out there. And I so no one gets crooked. Some of the old, I worry about some of the older guys. You know, they've they got to make money. They have to make a living. But, you know, what if one of them dies on the court? Hey, Coach, I only got about 30 seconds. My Rhode Island fans back east want me to ask you if, if uh, they, their theory is think big, we do. But can they can they think big? Can Rhode Island make another run? No question. You know they they can be better than Butler and VCU because they have the facilities. It's a beautiful state. They're like a little ride from Boston, a train ride from New York. The train stops right at the campus. Beautiful campus. You're, you're just a few miles from the most beautiful ocean in America. I mean, that is you know. I wish they were paying some money when I was there. I had to get out. 50000 You only made 50000 yeah. I can't believe that. Yeah, and the president said, Ted Eddy, God rest his soul, said that I love the job that Tom has done, but we're not a basketball school, and I can't oh. justify paying a coach more than an English professor. Tom, I so can do it. that was like... That was it. I was gone. No wonder Texas offered him, I think, four hundred grand. Tom, I could talk to you all day long. Thank you so much. We loved you as a coach. Uh, I wanted to give you props for that. Dead Coach Walking. We'll go out and buy your book. How's that? Thanks so much. Coach Tom Penders, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Jim Parisi Show. We'll see you in the morning.